Hey, it's Adrian from Seven Spires and many other bands, and you're watching Richard Metal Fan. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Richard Metal Fan Interviews. This is episode number 33, and today's guest we have Adrian Cohen. Adrian is the vocalist for the band Seven Spires, a four-piece symphonic metal band from Massachusetts. We're going to be talking to her about her journey through music from where she started to now, well, as well as like the history of Seven Spires, and she also plays with other bands like Winds of Plague and Aventasia and a plethora of others. So we're going to do talk to her today. And so without further ado, let's go talk to Adrian. So what's up, guys? I am here with Adrian Cohen from Seven Spires, Winds of Plague, Aventasia, and a plethora of other bands. <laughs> so Adrian, how are you doing today? Um, not too bad. It's a little early to tell. I haven't been awake very long. <laughs> How oh, about wow. you? I'm doing pretty well. It's a good, lovely afternoon here in Georgia. Good. So anyway, basically this format is we're just going to go through your catalog as well as talk about like your journey from music from where you started to now. But let's just dive right back into the very beginnings. What were the first bands that got you into metal and what made you want to be a vocalist? Hmm. One of the first bands that got me into metal uh, was Children of Bodom. Ooh. I'm a yeah. I've been a pianist for as long as I could sit up, <laughs> yeah. and um, I, I took piano lessons starting when I was five until uh, maybe eleven or twelve, and uh, I was very interested in singing. I was in choirs and theater productions and stuff like that, but um, I was primarily a keyboardist. And uh, Children of Bodom was the first metal band with a keyboardist that I ever found and that was the point where I was like hey I, I could I could maybe be in a one of these dang old things um so that, they're a really special band to me yeah and um yeah let's see I think uh, I my uncle gave me a, a cd of like 80s hair bands um like rat and uh, bands like that when I was probably in middle school and I enjoyed it and then forgot about it. And then in high school, I started finding my way again. Um, so yeah, I would, I would say children of Bodom is probably one of the first. Yeah. It's cool because Bodom for me was like those first bands that really, when I was a teenager that would later get me into like death metal or even black metal as I got older. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as you asked me about being a, a vocalist. Yeah. When did I want to be, a, I don't know. I've always just been, uh, my mom told everybody that my life was a musical so I, I take this to me and I've always been annoying and like saying in the house and it like, shut up, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, good uh, question. Sorry. Am sure. I allowed, am I allowed to swear or do you try to hey, keep it hey, like demonetized? Hey, Hey, uh, Hey, I don't make money, money off. This is just for fun. So do whatever okay. you want. Okay. Like, right on. Fuck right on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. If you, if you crack the, the F ice, then, then we're good. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So tell me about like, like from what I saw, I was doing my research on metal archives. Like what you think your first band was called riot underground. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, okay. Yeah. So I was studying at the Academy of contemporary music in Guilford, England. And, um, it's, uh, like a trade school. I had the equivalent of a uh, associate's degree from there. Um, so for any Americans watching, I, I went there for 11th and 12th grade basically. And I studied uh, vocal performance in 11th grade. It was a one-year program. And then artistic development and songwriting in basically 12th grade. And that was also a one-year program. They do also offer degrees um, for at, at a university level. But um, I ended up going somewhere else. So while I was there, I was um, just cutting my teeth, really. Um, yeah, just trying to get good at performing as a vocalist in a band rather than on stage as a, a theater person. Um, practicing being a, a, a good band leader as much as possible, trying to find my way um, artistically. Riot Underground was more of a like a heavy rock band. Um, the writers were primarily um, I don't know if I can really say this truthfully because I don't, it was so long ago that I almost don't remember, but I, the way I remember it, it was a lot of uh, me and the guitar player, Matthew Long. Um, and he's a phenomenal blues player. Uh, and we also did the like after school metal workshop thing together. So we would go and jam uh, different subgenres of metal every uh, Monday night. 
Um, so yeah, it definitely had so, a lot more bluesy influence than this than the stuff that I do currently. Um, but yeah, he's a phenomenal player, and actually, he's a an award winning musician now. Um, oh wow! In the UK, yeah, he's toured all over Europe. Um, he has, I think, multiple awards from the BBC, and uh, yeah, he's just I I don't think I know a better blues player than him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's cool, cool, you, cool. You were so you were in England for a bit. Yeah, I was there for five years and uh, the Hague for one year. Oh wow! I'm surprised you didn't pick up like an English accent or something while you were there. I think I did have a little bit of one. Um, like white like, pip pip chidio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't quite like that, but um, it was. It was awkward because I was definitely more American than the average Brit and more english than the average american so anytime i would go anywhere people would be like where are you from why do you talk like that um yeah and i mean it you know hearing that enough it, it kind of makes you feel like you don't belong anywhere but that's okay because we got music and that's all that matters oh, that's awesome so how did seven spires form because i believe you all formed in 2013. that's correct um while i was in riot underground i was still doing my uh, musical research, finding new things that I liked. I had quite some stuff that I wanted to say musically and just didn't yet have the tools. Um, I wanted to have a sort of dark theatrical band, but I was already in this rock band and it didn't quite make sense to try to um, steer them in that direction. So I, I was brainstorming and listening to a lot of Camelot and um, some uh, Annette era Nightwish. And of course, I've always loved Demi Borgir. Hell yeah. Um, that was I probably should have mentioned that when I said Children of Bodom as well. Hey, but. Yeah, I saw your cover of uh, the Serpentine Offering. It sounds sick. Oh, thanks, man. Um, I saw this live performance of uh, Progenies of the Great Apocalypse with a, a full orchestra. Like yeah, when yeah. not not like when Forces of Northern Night came out, but like way fucking back in the day. And I was like, I didn't know you could do that. I didn't yeah. know you could have a full orchestra. So that was like a big formative musical event as well. Yeah, um yeah. but yeah so my... yeah, sorry, sorry you're saying you're saying go ahead oh uh okay so yeah in like 2012 when i was still with riot i was like thinking about like the project that i really wanted to do like it was going to be the solo project um and then i moved to boston because i got accepted into berkeley and um i met jack there on in my first week in the berkeley bookstore <laughs> we were buying textbooks and um I was already on the lookout for people, like-minded people, um, who I could make some art with. And, um, yeah, I stood behind him in line and I gave him my business card. <laughs> and we just talked about, I was, I was wearing a Nightwish shirt. Um, and he was like, hey man, nice shirt. And, uh, we, we just like, I told him about the band that I wanted to make. And he was like, that sounds sick. And he said, this motherfucker said, let me know if you ever get the rest of your band together. And I was like, Oh, that's fine. You haven't met me yet. Okay. <laughs> so I called him. I called him because I found like a temporary lineup and um, we played like one show with these people and I, I sent them my demos and stuff and we just kind of rehearsed every week. This is a long answer. How much time do you have? Hey, we have pl plenty of time. Okay. I could, literally, I could talk forever. So like I said, yeah. feel free to just be like, shut up, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I'm polite. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, in 2013, I met Jack. I had the the idea of this band, and I had like about an album's worth of demos. Half of them got thrown out because they were shit. Um, but that's okay. It's what happens when you're 18 and still trying to figure out who you are and what you want to do and stuff like that. Um, but we didn't actually solidify the current lineup until I think 2014, 15, something like that. Um, yeah. And that's when that's when we really started getting uh, pretty pretty serious about stuff. So, yeah. All right, all right. So then, 2014, you dropped your date the debut EP, Cabaret of Dreams. That's well, right. How did that come to be? Um, so Cabaret of Dreams was, I really wanted to make an album, but uh, my parents are extremely supportive of me, and they're like, mm, maybe we'll help you fund an EP first and um, see how it does on the market, see if it's something that because um, I was 18, you know, it's like. Don't spend all your money unless you're absolutely certain. And this was something that I hadn't done before. And, um, you know, North America is not exactly known for symphonic metal or anything. Well, at that time, I feel like there's some good, like, some good names now. 
Especially yeah, you have to like dig, dig, dig further in. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but at the time, there was a lot of like thrash and hardcore stuff that when when I came back to America, a lot of like death metal and things like that. So um, yeah, we made this EP. It's it's the first half of our full length Solvay, and uh, it was we needed to make a record so that we could say, here we are. We're Seven Spires. Buy our record. Tell your friends. Play us on your radio station. Let's see what happens. It's like a first pass. See see if it works. Yeah, sort of like the sneak preview of what's to come. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I really think that this is a, a smart way to go about doing things um, for any new band. So you don't like initially spend like, I don't know, $10,000 just to make your, your first album, not knowing if it's good or if people are going to like it, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. I got gotcha. you. So then, moving on, you you're briefly. I think you're with played with a uh, Mike Kerr from 2015 to 2018. I tell me about Mike Kerr. I met him at um, a venue called Sammy's Patio in Revere, Massachusetts. Um, he's very interested in old school style um, guitar playing. <laughs> I have a soft spot for anything 80s, um, yeah. and. Uh, I thought, why not sing some rock and roll for a while? And uh, so I, I did some guest appearances with him, and uh, we played some shows together. Yeah. All right, and then you, we, we next up is a uh, for firstborn, which is a little little side project. I know you dropped like one one album called Riot. What was that whole thing about? Um, Mike was like, maybe we should make a band, and I was like, okay. Um, and we made an album. We played some shows. And uh, it turned out to not be exactly what I thought it was going to be. And um, I ended up having a lot on my plate anyway. So I didn't have the energy to fight to be listened to. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think we had differing points of view on, on um, direction artistically and how things should operate. So uh, in the end, I mean, I, I had to because I, I joined Avantasia and Sasha's band and it was like I had so much on my plate and I wanted to be able to give my best energy to everything that I was commi committed to. Um, so I, I, I left as amicably as I could, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope that we're still in good terms. I occasionally still get messages from them, yeah. uh, like WhatsApps and stuff. So I think we're fine. Yeah, that's good to hear. And then I think also that same year you'd, you'd had the light and shade with the essence of everything thing how did that project come up to be uh marco pastor you know the guitar player who's also in temperance and um like a million other bands hit me up on facebook because he heard the cabaret of dreams on some compilation cd and there's this one really long note um save us all good morning good morning voice sorry That's but good. It, I, I like scream this like stupidly long note for like a hundred years and he was like, there's no fucking way she does this live. And then he watched a live video and he was like, oh, she totally does it live. All right, let's see what we can do. So he hit me up and he was like, hey, you're really cool. Do you want to make an album? And I was like, not yet done with college and just trying to do everything possible. So I said, yes. Um, in 2016, I flew to Milan after my um, spring semester at college. And um, we made the album. And um, yeah. That's pretty yeah. much it. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. You're good. Anyway, then anyway, back to Seven Spires. In 2017, you dropped the debut full length album, So Vague. Did you guys knew you were on to something when you made this this album? Um, yes. <laughs> There's uh I I uh I've I've said this I think in one other interview, but usually when I'm on the right track, I get this is gonna sound kinda like woo woo, but I, I have some feeling in my heart or some kind of sign or like a particular just something happens and it's like it's like the universe is letting me know that i'm on the right track somehow and when we made solve i had that feeling um <clears throat> and um sasha referred to us as like one of the like only new uh real personalities in metal and when somebody who has seen so many bands says something like that I, it's that, that was probably the thing where I was like, all right, we're going to be okay. Let's go. Let's go. 
<laughs> that's cool. And when I first heard this album, I think it's very, very diverse with like very different sounds. Was there sort of like preconceived ideas or just did it come out that way? Um, some of those songs were born in like 2012 um, while I was still in England. For example, uh, Ashes and Burn were written on... What's going on with my camera? Let's focus. Ashes and Burn uh, were written in my old house in England. It was just like shitty old demos that I had that I, I showed to Pete, Jack, and Chris. And um, yeah, pretty much everything had been planned for a long time. And in fact, we had recorded... I think in 2015, we recorded like all the bass and guitars and vocals. So um, it just took a long time to get released. Yeah. These yeah. things happen. Yeah, I didn't know it take, took that long. So I guess thing with what since it's been around that long, does like the original kind of like ideas of those songs like change over that course of time? I think we rewrote it three times. <laughs> all right. And sort of like, <laughs> <laughs> like being as there's like different so sounds and like elements like i know there's hints of like black metal and and symphonic metal and fol folk metal it's, i'm pretty much sure there's like different vibes and different like emotions behind all the songs on mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um it, it is a concept album as all of our albums are and um i like to pull from different subgenres to highlight certain emotions or scenes in in the story Right. I, we we just make what we like to hear, you know. Right. And the sort of like depending on the style, does there's also do you have to like put yourself in like a different mind frame emotionally? Um. Yeah. Definitely. Uh. We're not really. Um. I I'm very interested in escapism. I I mean I'm also <clears throat> all about processing what you're going through in real life, but I'm also like, look where I live. Like yeah. <laughs> I don't want to live in real life. Yeah. um so <laughs> yeah it's a cool setup by the way thanks thanks um yeah i i just try to sometimes we'll, i'll like put on like a certain outfit or something to help me like get into character more while i'm working that's cool <laughs> yeah yeah awesome so then also during that that same year you 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 joined winds of plague how did you hook up with those guys um i was hmm. It was early January 2017, I think. Would that be true? I think that's when it was. Yeah, that was when it was. Oh, man. Um, I was in Boston for some work stuff, Spire stuff. I got a message from Art, the drummer, that was like, we need a keyboardist. Can you learn the set in two weeks? And I was like, yes. <laughs> um, uh, and then I was like, can we meet up or something are you going to be at nam and he was going to be at nam so you know i'm like i'm pretty adventurous i'll go on tour without meeting like most of the people that i'll be on tour with but i would like to at least know one person and like get a sense of like who i'm gonna spend like some extended amount of time like smelling the farts of and waking up next <laughs> to you. you know what i mean like so i i i met um art at nam and he seemed all right so I went home and I learned the set and I I bought a shirt from Blackcraft and uh, oh. <laughs> made a, a vest to wear on stage and awesome. It was really fun and the best part was because I was so mad about Berkeley. Um, like it's an amazing place. I was just like not in a good place in my head. Um, but when I got home from that tour, in the airport, my mom was picking me up at baggage claim and I opened my email and it said, "Congratulations, you've graduated." Oh, wow. And I was like, and they're like, oh, it's too late for you to sign up to to walk this year, like to do the graduation ceremony. And I was like, I literally don't fucking care. I just went on my first like national tour um, with a metal band. We opened for like, I think the, the headliner was Devil Driver or something. And the Agonist was on the bill. And that was really cool. Nice. Um, yeah, it was like, that, what a lineup. Fuck your stupid graduation. I got to, I did the thing that I went to school for. So <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah. i still still jam, jam the last album what is what is my enemy i think it's a sick album i'm nice. waiting, waiting for winds of plague to play in atlanta i'm there right on i'm waiting for a call All right. <laughs> I'm waiting for them to call me yeah, yeah. and then I going it, yeah you're saying go ahead oh no i just like they're all grown-ass men and uh have grown-ass men lives yeah <laughs> so I, right. I, I don't really know what we're waiting for but that's okay that's i'll be here when they call me 
cool. So then, then next up, you around 2018, you joined Avantasia to do some live stuff. How did you hook up with the Avantasia guys? Um, Sasha called me while I was at a friend's wedding. <laughs> and he was like, what are you doing summer of 2019? And um, yeah, when, when someone like this, specifically when Sasha asks you, what are you doing? The answer is going to be, I don't know. What am I doing? <laughs> um, let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll make... I'll make time. And uh, he said that uh, Avantasia and and Amanda were parting ways and they needed a, a new female backing vocalist. And it turned out there was going to be two of us. And um, he had to like submit me to Toby and show that I was going to be a cool singer. And um, in the end, I learned that it was not only because I could get the job done, but it was also because I'm, I guess, a nice person um, and I'm easy to tour with. I'm not really like high maintenance or a diva and I don't need, I don't need to be like at the front of the stage or I don't need to bring like 20 bags with me. So I, I think, yeah. And he was like, it's going to be so good for your career. And yeah, he just called me and um, it, it wasn't until I think November or December, 2018 that I got the final call of like, yep, you're going to be on the tour. And then we announced the tour like the next day. So <laughs> Oh, wow. I mean, it wasn't like the next day, but it was like within weeks of of learning that I was going to be on it. So, it was it was pretty wild. That was also like the same week that I signed the um, the contract for Spires with Frontiers, and uh, also on that same day, I was covered in like six Labrador puppies. So it was like one of the best <laughs> days of my life. <laughs> yeah, because who doesn't love puppies, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, and I know if like you've played with like Seven Spires with Winds of Plague and Avantasia. There's like like you have to like put yourself in like a different mind frame depending on the project. Or there's just like a usual like game plan with with all the method of, or method behind all the madness that plays. Um, in each band, I have a different role, and uh, each band brings out a different aspect of my artistry. I guess such a like. <laughs> my artistry um but uh yeah i before i go out with any given band or project that i'm involved with i think about like who i am with that band what they want from me what the fans want from me what can i offer um and also how am i how am i going to conduct myself um just in an interpersonal kind of way um, do I feel more comfortable taking up a little more space? Am I going to be more comfortable than last time? Things like that. Also, um, I don't know if you were going to talk about Masters of Ceremony. Um, oh, yeah. we were. I was actually was about to get to that. You pretty okay. much led me right in there. You read right my on. mind. <laughs> okay. I was like, hmm, you named all of them except for one. Should yeah, I didn't, say didn't forget about that. Okay. That I, I did my research before this interview. That's, okay. that's the main component. <laughs> Fantastic. So how did Masters of Ceremony come to be? Um, this is really weird, actually. So in two, it must have been 2017 or 18, um, Sasha called me and was like, hey, I'm looking for... Frontiers is putting together a band. They want me to put together a band. And um, uh, I would love for you to be my singer. And then also, <clears throat> Art called me and was like, hey, I have a friend, um, Frontiers is asking them to put together a band, do you want to be the singer? I recommended you. Um, so then at some point, I had to talk to Frontiers' like, artist relations or like A&R person in North America and be like, hi, like two of your artists want me to sing for them. I feel like it'd be kind of weird to sing for both. I choose Sasha. I will always choose Sasha. Be loyal to him forever um and they're like great do you want to also sign your band <laughs> it's like yeah let's go thank you oh. um um but yeah that was basically how masters of ceremony came about and um it's definitely a much different vibe than anything else that i've done because um sasha has done so much in his life and um I think he finally has a, a an outlet to really be himself, and I think that's what he wants with uh, Masters. So I'm really I feel so honored to be part of it and getting to write with somebody that is basically my like my songwriting idol. <clears throat> I I can't even begin to tell you how incredible that feeling is. Um, yeah. 
Awesome. Awesome. Like, and I also love, love your voice. In my opinion, you're one of the best metal vocalists going today. They, 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 with all the, these projects that, that, that we talked about, do you ever have to like adjust your voice depending on the project or, or are you just ever allowed to like be yourself? Uh, I absolutely adjust, um, to the project and that's, that's not out of anything other than trying to serve the songs as the first priority. <clears throat> I have spires where I can freely be myself. Um, I have an outlet to just be at, without thinking. I can just be. Um, but everywhere else, yeah, I'm definitely uh, a hired gun to some degree. And I'm very happy to show up and do my job as best as I can. Um, so for something like Winds of Plague, um, when we are recording, for example, when we recorded Blood of My Enemy, um, I gave a few different vocal styles. Um, one would be like the Adrian version. One would be like, okay, if you hired Haley Williams to sing this, it would maybe sound like this. Um, and they really liked the Haley Williams version. Well, that's fine. Um, when I sing with Avantasia, I, I, this one I have to adjust my technique because I have to sing for three and a half hours. Um, my technique is usually like sprint, not a marathon. Um, but Avantasia is definitely a marathon, so I have to like dial back my power by like 30 to 40 percent <laughs> and uh only give 100 percent that sounds bad i only give like my lead vocal style uh when i go and do lead vocals it was very interesting actually to do that tour and learn how to be a backing vocalist um in a really serious way does that make sense yeah totally i gotcha yeah, yeah. I, I love to be a supporting member of any project, uh, so like I'm not like salty or anything. I don't I don't know if I came off that way. Um, I I really like I like making other people happy, and I really like making other people look good. So um, yeah. Awesome. So then we're finishing off with the latest two Seven Spire albums. Uh, what's next up? We're talk about is Emerald Seas. Seas. <laughs> what was that whole recording and writing of it? So I wrote it <clears throat> in 2015. That was when most of the demos were initially oh, wow. born. Yeah. So you wrote the, the second album while writing the first. We The first one was already written. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Jeez, so you're way ahead of the game. Yeah. We we work a long way ahead. Actually, so Jack is actually here at my house right now to um, start working on album four. Oh, wow. You're all... Yeah. Man, you just keep writing. It just never stops. It We have to because... Everyone in the band is extremely busy, and uh, yeah. also we've all agreed that our best work um, needs to sit and marinate in its own juices. Right. So we have to like, we can't just like shit an album out and then oh it's perfect and it's done. Um, it has to like maybe we leave it alone for like three months, come back, tweak some things. Oh, that's actually a load of shit. We're gonna throw that out and write a new thing there. Um, but yeah, Emerald Seas, we wrote it. Originally in 2015, made some changes 2016. We were already also writing some other stuff. Initially, we were going to put out what became Gods of Debauchery. Yeah, which um, we'll talk about in just a sec, but let's yes. talk about Emerald Seas first. Yeah, but um, there's a lot of references musically on Gods of Debauchery that, I mean, the re they're references to Emerald Seas, so it just made no sense to put out that one first. So we, we were like, we had two and we we're like, ah, shit, okay, let's do Emerald Seas first. All right. So uh, we did that, and uh, then uh, the fucking COVID hit, yeah. and that was really the best thing that's ever happened. Yeah, I still not refused to give that 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 virus any publicity on my channel. All right. Yep, that's fine. We don't have to talk about it. It was, yeah. it was uh, ruined our touring plans, but that's okay. We found a way to stay connected with our fans, and that was really important. You know, so then with then right when when you released Emerald Seas, was there like any pressure to follow up Savig? Um I mean obviously we want to do our best and uh, I personally am unfortunately the kind of person that uh, I push myself to be better than I than every time I want to do better than I did last time. And I think actually I think all four of us are that way. So there was no pressure from like the label or anything, but we wanted to, and also had been like it, it was like three years in between albums. So we, no one was like hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. But we were like, 
let's go we want to hurry up it, does that answer your question yeah yeah pretty much and like kind of like answering what i answered but asked before with Saveg, especially since it like since you started writing for emerald season 2015 did like the whole arrangements sort of like change over that period and kind of like answer with Saveg does like 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 since it takes since the, it's been a while since the when you first started does is it hard to like maintain that kind of like original idea We didn't rewrite it three times like we wrote or rewrote Solve, but um sorry, can you ask can you ask a question again? I like it it's like sat in my head and then I thought about it and then it, it's gone. <laughs> just just like like how how it start started out originally since it's been was was like you mentioned like in twenty fifteen that the, was it hard to like maintain that original I idea? Oh, to... oh no, no. Um I think, uh, despite all of us being extremely busy, I think, um, when I get fixated on something, it's the only thing it's, it takes up the main, like 60% of my brain power. So every day I wake up, I have my coffee. I think about Emerald Seas. I go to work or I go to school, I guess. I think about Emerald Seas while I'm in lyric writing class. I go to sc school and think about Emerald Seas while I'm in like orchestration class. I go back to my apartment. I work on Emerald Seas. I forgot to eat. Jack's like, did you eat today? No. Okay. We eat. We talk about Emerald Seas. Adrian goes to bed. Uh, that's, <laughs> it's never really hard to, to keep the original idea because yeah, it's, it's the same universe. And, um, I don't know. I've been living in that universe mentally since 2012. So, I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> All right, and then now we're to talk about like the latest album, Gods of Debauchery, which is a very quick turnaround from Emerald Seas. Seas, I'm guessing when this COVID th thing hit, did you all well, did you all just decide to just keep writing thing after Emerald Seas was released? Yeah, we were we played the only show of our tour with Insomnium and Omnium Gatherum, and um, as we were in the RV driving it back to Cruise America or whatever it's called, um, I was like. Jack, do you want to just come to my house and write instead of going home and being sad? And he was like, "Yeah, we can. We can go to your house and be sad and write music about it." <laughs> um, and uh, Pete and Chris were like, "That's a great idea. Send us demos as soon as they're ready." And um, so we did. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So, did you consider like God's debauchery just picking up after M or did you just almost kind of like consider it like a new beginning for Seven Spires in a way? Yes. <laughs> Um, as we were writing it, we had this feeling of, um, this is a little bit different and this is something special. Um, same kind of thing. Like I told you when you, when you are on the right track or when I'm on the right track, I get that certain feeling. And we had that feeling <clears throat> about gods of debauchery. So it seemed like it might be some kind of new chapter, but it's very much still us and it's the most us we've ever been. Hmm. And it is, of course, it's still like in the same universe in terms of like the concept and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, d does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. Good on. Awesome. So, if somebody were to first discover Seven Spires, should they listen to every album in order? Should they start with like Savig and then Emerald Seas or God to Debauchery, or does it just can be approached like any other album? Like anybody can start from any other album. Um, it's my preference that people would find us and be like, oh, that's really cool, and then go Emerald Seas, Solve, Gods of Debauchery. But um, also all the songs are designed to, you can enjoy them as one-offs. Um, but I think there's definitely um, something to be said for sitting down and listening to a whole album. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Gods of Debauchery is really fucking long, so I know that not everybody has time for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's not like 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 the albums aren't like the Lord Lord of the Rings like Lord of the Rings they can like you can like listen to them any other way. I mean, you can you can do whatever you want, but the the story starts with Emerald Seas uh, as the prequel, and then we have Solve, and then the follow up is Gods of Debauchery. If you're interested in the lore, you can also go to sevenspiresband dot com slash lore, um, and there's a a written there's a text that goes over the story of all three albums and there's also a narration of it if you're like 
if you want to wash the dishes and listen to an epic story instead of reading it or something. Awesome. So, so as a vocalist, do you need to hear music in order to come up with, with lyrics or do you usually have like a lyrical concept in mind and that can help determine the music itself? Um, it all comes out however it comes out. I, I don't need one or the other. Um, yeah, I, I consider myself more of a songwriter than anything. Um, yeah, it just happens to be that I'm a pretty okay vocalist. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're amazing. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. So do you, do you tend to like leave your lyrics open to interpretation or you try to like engage the listener into what the songs are about? Um, they're very personal to me, but I try to write them in a way that's like just specific enough that if you've experienced anything similar to what the lyrics are about, then you're going to be like, she wrote this about me. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm not out here in interviews being like, this song is about this. And if you think it's about something else, you're wrong. Cause, um, yeah, I, I think, um, the most important, like once it's out of my hands, once the song is out of my hands, it's, it's about whatever the listener, whatever meaning they find in it. And, um, yeah. I, I recently, uh, we played that New Year's show and uh, I spent quite a lot of time with our fans and uh, my patrons. They're called the Coffee Cult. And wow. um, yeah, just getting to hear their stories and how they connect with our music um, is really incredible. And um, I have a, a Discord server for my patrons and sometimes I'll see somebody talking about like, Oh, I, I'm so thankful for a song like This God is Dead to help me process the death of both of my parents. And I like I see that I got both of my parents. So for me, that's not what the song is about. But to see that it helps someone in that way is like it, it wow. It's uh there's no feeling like it. So yeah. yeah, and yeah, and you pretty much led me into my next question. Could like somebody's like own interpretation of their songs maybe would help look at you differently as an artist? I guess. I don't know. I mean, um, are you aware of parasocial relationships? I have never heard of that. That's news to me. Okay. So a parasocial relationship, as far as I understand it, and this was a new term that was um, explained to me in the last couple of weeks. Um, it's basically like, you know how sometimes, uh, people who watch a YouTuber a lot like religiously think that they're friends with this youtuber but the youtuber has never met that person oh. um so <laughs> this also happens as a musician and um I, this is not i'm not saying this about any specifically about the coffee call because i literally spend so much time with them so i actually know them as people and they are my friends but sometimes i meet somebody that thinks they know me or they know us as people and we've never fucking met them but they speak to us as if we're besties and it's a little bit weird. Um, so when you talk, when you talk about like people interpreting our music and then having it change the way they see us, that's the first thing I think of. But honestly, most of our fans are extremely respectful and mostly it's like, I don't know you, but, and you don't know what you've done for me, but thank you so much for, for this song. So usually it's it's pretty all right. Cool, cool. So kind of like continuing with songwriting. So does does like ideas like come out of like nowhere? Or does is it like pretty much planned? Um, we don't really write with a formula. So there's we don't say like okay, I want to make Cabaret of Dreams Mark II or like let's make Solvay again. This I think this honestly bands that do this, I have a problem with this, but that's fine. Um, we don't have to get into that. Um, usually it's there. The songs are kind of born out of, I'll have an intense feeling or like a vibe. And, um, this is what we refer to as a song seed. And from that seed, I can say, I think it's going to be about this. Um, it'll include these ly lyrical themes. Um, it'll probably have a groove kind of like this. Um, it'll have this harmonic coloring. Um, and I'll usually sit at a, a keyboard or something and just kind of like play some chords and try to capture what I'm feeling. Yeah. So they're, they're kind of born out of nothing, but also, I mean, when you have one person writing 
it always sounds a little bit like them. So um, it's not exactly completely random. Awesome. So type, like, kind of like with these, with like you all write concept albums, have you ever thought about like expressing it like through other mediums, such as like novels or movies or stuff like that? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm working on a, a related project right now, actually. Um, and I have a few other ideas that I've had since probably like 2012, honestly. Um, well, 10 really years into, in the making. Yeah. I'm really into gaming. Um, I've been a, a gamer since I was a kid. Um, recently started playing D&D. &D. Um, wow. Uh, everyone, a lot of people have suggested uh, graphic novels. Um, and yeah, like I said, I wrote a, a quick text on our um, website if you want to experience the story that way. Um, I have one author, well, I have a couple of author friends, but I have one specifically, if he ever felt like it, I would ask him to write the story um, in like a, a book form. But yeah, I think there's a, a lot to explore and only so many hours in the day, unfortunately. Yeah, awesome. Like I was like, since you mentioned like you're a gamer, I gotta ask what, what console you grew up with? I was definitely a Nintendo kid for a oh. long time. Oh, and, uh, I, I was a place. I'm a PlayStation guy. Sorry. That, that's okay. okay. I recently switched to PC um, in last June. I got this like bomb ass new computer, and uh, I'm able to play like a fuck ton of games that I just missed out on. <clears throat> so yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've ever thought. Yeah, you hmm? were saying. No, go ahead. Like, I ever thought about like making like a Twitch channel. I have one. <laughs> oh, I didn't even knew that because I know a lot of musicians are on Twitch, like the guys from Trivium, Brittany from Unleashed the Archers, like so many like musicians have been on like Twitch and I've been watching them all like pretty much when this pandemic started. Ah, okay, yeah. So for the last three months, uh, I was practicing every Monday and Friday vocally. I was training for the New Year's show because I've never had to be a lead vocalist for an hour and a half. So I, I would practice and um, yeah, it spoiled the set list, but I don't think people really minded and um, it was a really nice way to connect with fans, especially ones that knew they weren't going to be able to make the show. And um, <clears throat> I mean, I need to practice anyway. So it, it was super nice to like also make a little bit of money entertaining. It. I don't know. Yeah. Awesome. And with like playing games, does it kind of almost in a way, way kind of like, like inspire like ideas musically? Absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, I'm really big on soundtracks and, uh, also, I, I just, I fucking love storytelling. So it, it all goes into my brain and I try to find the best parts and express them in a way that's relevant to my feelings. All right. And with, with concept albums, does like personal no experience like influence like the, the music and lyrics? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. In every single songwriting class I've ever taken, and I started taking them very, like, when I was 15, I was homeschooled and uh, I was taking Berkeley courses for songwriting and lyric writing, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, a bunch of other fucking topics that don't matter right now. But um, the first thing that I learned in this songwriting class when I was 15 is you should always write what you know, um, because you're able to give it specifics that someone who's not experienced it wouldn't be able to really express. So uh, I always write <clears throat> about my experiences. Okay, I don't have a magical ship that will take me where my heart desires. Um, so we have to like spin some fantasy into it and um, that's fine. But I I used to be a little bit embarrassed about the fact that it was a little bit autobiograph autobiographical. But um, as it turns out, people really appreciate honesty. And um, a lot of people don't have the words to say how they're feeling. And um, when when you give them a piece of art that says, here's how you probably feel, they're like, oh my God, thank you so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> in fact, I just got a Christmas card um, last month that was like, thank you for your art and for helping me feel things I didn't even know I could ever feel. And for, for like, um, I can't remember exactly the wording, but it was something like, saying it so that I, I knew how to say it. Um, yeah. All right. And so like going through, through the live show, is there like a different for kind of like energy to playing live as opposed to like recording or they're almost kind of like, like two separate beasts altogether? Oh, they're absolutely separate beasts. I don't know any musician that would say differently. 
um it's yeah in the studio it's it's pretty um i'm hard on myself always but in the studio it's like i need to do that again let me do that again nope gotta do it again i gotta get it perfect and then uh, i practice a lot to give a good live performance but then when i'm on the stage it's like all right this is about connection and expression it's not about getting a perfect perfect take or anything so yeah, do you ever have to like practice like like crowd interaction absolutely yeah in fact i think everyone should um and also i mean like there's nothing more cringeworthy in my book <laughs> than like shitty crowd interaction <laughs> um it it just i i how can I say it? I try my, my best to be a good leader and a good person and like a role model in uh, across aspects of my life and being on stage physically in front of these people, helping them through their feelings. I want to make sure that I, I am strong and um, make them feel safe. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. So I got two more questions for you. Are you at, like you ready for the hardest interview question? Sure. How do you know when a song is done? Jack tells me. <laughs> That's like the best answer ever. <laughs> yep. He's really good at picking out good ideas from bad ideas, or he'll make a decision. Even if both ideas are good, he'll be like, mm, do that one. Um, and I trust him completely. And uh, he, I, I'm thankful to have basically a producer like that like that kind of influence in my life because otherwise i'm just gonna fucking sit here and keep orchestrating and it's, it's fucking endless so yeah yeah all right and the final question i want to ask is coming from massachusetts like there's like so many different bands like even like got the metalcore bands like kill switch engage all that remain shadows fall and even like heavier bands like abnormality so there and i feel like there's like massachusetts has like a diverse scene in metal so there was like a scene in the massachusetts area where you were, were from or was the goal for seven spires to like get outside of massachusetts or even just in the new england area in general and just play in front of like different crowds and audiences I, ever since I moved away, I was born in Houston and I grew up there. And ever since I moved away to England when I was 12, I started thinking globally. So it was never about like, oh, be part of the Massachusetts scene or be part of the New England scene. Yes, it is important to genuine with people, but it was never, it's always been conquer the world. And then it changed from conquer the world to connect with the people that matter. Um, but that's very much on a, on a global scale. We have a, a Facebook group called the seventh brigade and we have a couple of, I have, we have a discord server called the seventh brigade and we have the, the coffee cult server and there's people from Japan, Australia, all over Europe, the UK, uh, North America, South America. We, it's, there's not really a, a scene other than the melodic metal scene, I guess, or the metal scene. It's just, yeah. I, I honestly don't even really fucking care about scene politics anymore. I just want to make art and connect with people that appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah. So awesome. So uh, before we go, I just want to thank you for this interview. It's just anything else with uh, Seven Spires or Winds of Plague Amitasia that you would like to promote. I'm looking forward to seeing you, you with Seven Spires on the Dragon Force Tour in April. I'm going to see you play at the Masquerade in Atlanta. So it's just anything else you would like to promote? Um, I mean, you, you said it, the, the Dragon Force tour is coming up. I'm super, super excited. I really hope it goes through that currently there's no reason it wouldn't, but you know how it just, can be sometimes yeah, just things knocking change on at wood. the last second. Yeah, exactly. Um, until then I'll be on Twitch practicing every Monday and Friday, probably. Um, yeah. Join the seventh brigade. We'll see you there. That's awesome, what I gotta sir. say. Oh, so awesome. Everybody, Adrian Cohen, we'll see you next time.